Okay, on today's show, fingerprints and face scans are required, three new driving laws or changes are coming this month to pee drivers off everywhere, and the doors have been blown wide open for a mountain load of suing. Let's begin. The article says that Tory peers and backbenchers are mounting a revolt against a new piece of woke legislation that will force employers to run their businesses like police states to avoid being embroiled in continual litigation. The Worker Protection Bill, which has already made it through multiple common sittings, will introduce a legal requirement for companies and public bodies to take all reasonable steps necessary to prevent their staff from being harassed, which admittedly doesn't sound too bad in theory, but listen to this. Tory politicians have complained that such practices will go beyond their calling and make it too easy for employees to take offence, and in the new laws which have been described by senior conservatives as draconian and mad, will allow shop assistants, bar staff and doctors to sue their employers if a member of the public offends them at work, the Telegraph reports. The balance between protecting employees from harassment while refraining from indulging in what has been termed wokeism, the Tory dissenters have claimed has been tipped over. Senior Tories warn the proposed law will lead to an explosion of litigation and force business owners to run their establishments like the police state. Rishi Sunak is seeking to position the Conservatives against woke policies, but the Worker Protection Bill has been criticised for legitimising as opposed to combating this growing movement. Well, to be honest, it seems absolutely bonkers to me that it could have gone through so many common sittings without someone actually spotting something like this in the first place. It's just absolutely mental, isn't it? I mean, how long will it actually be before nearly every employee out there goes, Oh, I'm offended! I'm offended! Right, I want want £1,000 please or whatever the amount is going to be from their bosses which no doubt is going to cause nothing but a mountain of problems even for us public because while they claim that we are the ones who offended them we are also the ones who are more than likely going to have to pay the extra costs that no doubt shop owners and whatever other businesses are going to have to put on top of their prices to combat any such claims taking place. Not only that, of course, but if businesses get too many employees suing them for what a customer does, that could potentially end up bankrupting some smaller businesses out there, which will then in turn make those employees redundant and having to claim things such as job seekers allowance and all the other benefits out there, and therefore only adding to the public tax burden. I mean, whatever happened to the sticks and stones saying, it just seems like nowadays, with the way that people keep reporting things as name call and things like that to the police, which is then referred to as a non-crime, then it just makes me wonder how long it'll actually be before that non-crime suddenly turns into a crime. Or even offending itself may turn into a crime. I mean, it wasn't too long ago, was it, before there was a, some sort of police poster saying offending is an offence when actually it isn't. And don't get me wrong, people being offensive to each other isn't very nice at all, but it isn't a crime. Unless, of course, they're using such language as things like the N-word and things like that, which will more than likely be put down to either a hate crime or discrimination or whatever. And no doubt, of course, businesses will more than likely want to put some sort of protection around themselves to make sure that not every employee they employ actually wants to sue them for whatever the customer chooses to say. That suddenly offends them. But of course, what would this sort of protection be? Would it be things like your employees have to talk like robots to people and not actually engage in comments other than that'll be however much please or do you need an extra carrier bag and things like that or maybe take away all the service altogether and just make it things like self-serve checkouts even more popular and obviously depending on the business go the whole online ordering route and cut out customer stores completely which is not going to be a good thing especially for people like the older generation for example who aren't really tech or online savvy and actually prefer to visit someone like a checkout person and things like that or maybe they'll just make table service standard where people just order on their phone pay and then you just get your items brought to you without any conversation at all other than here you go and then they leave no doubt of course if labor get in in 2024 which they're rumored to do they are often seen as quite woke i mean not so long ago i remember there's both a picture of Keir Starmer and Angela Rayner both taking the knee, as it was called back then, when the whole BLM movement kicked off. And whilst they appear to just love their virtue signaling, it isn't really strong leadership, in my opinion. So it does unfortunately make me wonder where the country will actually be in a few years' time, especially if bills like this actually do get through the House of Commons and become law. Drivers have been warned about a trio of new laws coming in force later on this month. The changes include modifications to vehicle taxes and even hefty fines for some motorists if they don't stay up to date with the rules. Here's what you need to know. Owners of electric vehicles, EVs, could see themselves slapped with hefty fines under new rules designed to stop them hogging much needed charging points. If you leave your vehicle at one point for too long, you could face a charge of up to £30 
depending on where you live. Glasgow City Council has apparently already imposed that fee, where other local authorities are bringing in overstay charges of £20, according to the Mirror. New vehicle tax rates, of course, came into force on April the 1st, with costs increasing for almost all vehicles. Newly registered vehicles will face charges of up to £2,605 for more polluting petrol and diesel models, up 240 from last year. Owners with the least polluting vehicles will pay just £30, up from 25 Meanwhile, vehicles registered between March 2001 and April 2017 will see high polluting vehicles pay £695 up front, or £729.75p in monthly instalments up from 630 and £661.50, respectively. Some local authorities will gain new powers in the spring to issue fines for motoring traffic offences, or what they deem as them. And such offences include driving in a bus lane or legal U-turns. Residents of Reading and Hampshire are set to see their councils empowered to give out fines from £20 up to £150, though the latter has been mainly reserved as punishments for non-payment of existing fines. But, you know, of course I could be wrong, but I would have thought their main game would have actually been trying to make EVs more desirable, especially as 2030 is fast approaching, which of course is apparently when all new vehicles have to be an electric and not just petrol or diesel, although I have been told in the comments that hybrids will still be available to 2035. Either way, though, it just doesn't seem like a proper solution to me, because it seems to me that instead of quickly installing more charges in more and more places, they're actually instead relying on, on finding people as a solution, when in fact it should be anything but a solution. We don't have that problem with pet, well, do we? We just turn up, put the pet well in, we don't have any overstay times or anything like that. I mean, you might get a funny look from the person who's waiting to get in your spot if you're in the shop for too long, maybe five or so minutes. But we don't get fined for it. And a fine of up to 30 quid above the savings that apparently EVs can give you mean that potentially you're not saving anything at all are you in fact it'll actually cost you a lot more in general won't it if you indeed turn up a bit too late that is but of course that's not the only problem with EVs is it? I mean let's go through a few of them shall we they're more expensive for a start aren't they which obviously outweighs quite a lot of savings that you could make on the electric itself which obviously the price of which is going up although Obviously, in July, it come down a bit, I'm guessing. They have less range, of course, than a lot of petrol-powered cars out there, including my C3. But not only that, of course, because the range that you get in winter is obviously shorter than you get in summer, and also on motorways is shorter as well than just driving through town. By quite a bit compared to how many miles per gallon you get on petrol from driving in town and on the motorway. Not only that, of course, but whereas petrol prices or diesel prices are all around the same sort of price, give or take a few pence, the cost a kilowatt hour or the energy varies greatly all depends on where you go I mean, it could be anywhere from about 10 or 15p if you've got a home charger and you charge at night to anything like 75p or upwards on one of those expensive fast chargers it also of course takes long time to fill up compared to the five minutes we have with petrol and because of the range you get you'd more than likely have to fill up more often as well which obviously of course isn't going to be too much of a problem for lucky people out there who have driveways but apparently some evs themselves not all of them granted but some of them do not come with both a granny charger a free pin plug for emergencies and the usual standard one so if you did need that cable you'd probably have to pay a couple hundred pounds extra just to get one and then of course we've got battery degradation which admittedly they are warranted for eight years and most of the time people do change their cars before that amount of time however i don't know about you but i have seen quite a lot of old cars out there from 2001 upwards maybe even some older than that and so those drivers themselves i'm guessing the only time they probably change their car is if the wheels are fallen off so that could pose quite a problem for them if their battery is nearly on the way out and any warranty has expired and of course from 2025 they'll be subject to expensive new car tax along with of course the overstaying charge that they recently just thought of it just is absolutely mental isn't it and you know what it kind of makes me think that i'll stay with my c3 a little bit longer and i don't have any particular rush to be visiting the dealer anytime soon and in fact, every time one of these stories comes out, it's just another nail, in my opinion, in the EV coffin itself. I mean, why should we all have to jump through these hoops from 2030 onwards if we want to buy a brand new car just because of the government's green agenda? It doesn't, doesn't seem fair to me. But obviously, hopefully, things will be improved by then. And speaking about tax itself, I bet those people who bought a car in between 2001 and 2017, if they bought a low CO2 one, of course, are more than likely laughing, aren't they? Because those sort of cars or cars like that are apparently 
either free from what I've heard or around 20 or 30 pounds a year. And therefore, if they do go up, I'm sure it won't be by much compared to the rates after 2017. And as for given councils, who some, of course, can have come across as quite money grabbing, the ability to find people, to be honest, doesn't really strike me as a very clever idea. Because if anything, potential fines will more than likely increase. And who knows if it actually works out really well for the councils, they'll more than likely put a lot more cameras dotted about everywhere to spot any potential driving offences from taking place, even though you or I may not classify it as an offence. And in those situations, it just makes me wonder if they'll actually try and find people anyway, and just hope they get away with it. Which, to be honest, I hope I'm wrong, but something tells me I'm not. Travellers are facing queues of up to seven times longer in Dover this summer, as a new fingerprint check system is set to be introduced in May. The new measure, known as the Entry Exit System, the EES, will take photos and fingerprints of people from third countries crossing the border and entering or exiting the European Union. The UK apparently has requested to be included in the new system as part of a Brexit deal after contributing to its development. While a member of the EU, the European Commission's Department for Migration and Home Affairs said that EES will replace the current system of manual stamping of passports, which is time-consuming, does not provide reliable data on border crossings, and does not allow systematic detection of overstayers. Models drawn up by the Slovakian government have shown that the additional checks will delay waiting times at the border by up to four minutes. The move means that non-European citizens, including Britons, will have to get their fingerprints and a facial biometric analysed every time they enter or leave the block. But Doug Bannister, chief executive of the Port of Dover, warned that checkpoint times could increase by up to seven times. Speaking to the Transport Select Committee, he said, what we have heard is that it's going to be two minutes per person to register, plus two minutes for the car, so that's about 10 minutes for a full group of four people. British travellers will also have to pay an online Euro visa that will cost £6 and require pre-registration. And of course, while this is more than likely okay for the EU to do, can you imagine if we also imposed a similar thing over here, where we required everyone to take fingerprints, face biometric detection or whatever it was, and things like that? No doubt, of course, people will say it goes against my human rights so I will not be doing such a thing. Good day. But I'm guessing they won't be saying any such things to the EU. Which, to be honest, I can understand that the EU probably wants to say that this is a security measure for everyone entering their countries. But surely that is what passports are for, isn't it? Where you see someone's passport and say, yes, that looks like you. You can come in. Personally, I think a much better thing would be that if someone comes in for a passport, it scans the passport herself and then flags up any potential problems a certain person has. Which, admittedly, you know, I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that is available already in some countries. And of course, I don't know about you, but it does make me wonder if this is some sort of slippery slope, because first of all, you'll start with fingerprints and face, but how long will it actually be before we then suddenly have to give up our DNA just to enter another country? And if so, could that then potentially lead to having people's DNA taken at birth? And whilst that would admittedly solve a lot of crimes, because of course you could then compare it to their DNA across the database, if you're an innocent person and don't actually do any crimes, then why should they even have your DNA in the first place? Another thing that is bound to annoy loads of people is how much this hotel chain is profiting with all those illegal boot people guests it has. Anyway, subscribe for more and I'll see you in the next one.